Now, what am I good at? I can shred on the drums, and I'm a marketing whiz. All right, welcome to another installment of Reel It In. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Jeremiah Prummer. Jeremiah is the CEO of No Commerce, the survey platform designed to help brands collect zero party data and better understand their customers. Jeremiah, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, 2023 now. So, uh, new year. It'll be an interesting, exciting year, I think, for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, uh, happy to be here. Yeah, certainly. We'll see how 2023 shakes out, but uh, I'm just lumping the last three years together into yeah. one year. So <laughs> hopefully sure. this can be its own distinct year. Um, cool. I'm really excited to talk about first party data, leveraging surveys. Um, I think especially right now, given a lot of the, the privacy constraints that have been imposed by various ad platforms, like it's a super relevant topic. Um, but yeah, before we jump into that, for those who aren't super acquainted with you, would you mind just giving a little overview of like how you got into this world of collecting first party data, leveraging surveys and, and what you're doing today? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I actually got started in the world of e-commerce technology in 2012. So I was, I was building WooCommerce extensions back in the day. So, um, you know, it was the hot open source platform um, for e-commerce. So uh, yeah, I did a lot of that, um, sold that, ran my own brand for a while. Um, helped a friend with his agency when he got it uh, rolling back in 2018. And then uh, pandemic hit 2020. Um, and my friend Pearson, who runs an agency called Lunar Solar Group, uh, he and I decided that, and we kind of been working on this for a while, but we decided we wanted to go ahead and build a technology company. And so the product that we settled on was no commerce. And no commerce is essentially, um, you know, zero party data is kind of the hot term right now, but basically it's surveys and collecting information about your customers uh, directly from the customer. So you're letting the customer give you insight and information um, with explicit consent, which I think is a really important piece of this. Um, we've had a lot of data about customers in the past uh, through Facebook and, and different platforms, but uh, a lot of that was just kind of scraped data or data where somebody was answering a question. I mean, that's honestly like the, a lot of the Facebook data was people answering questions, right? Um, but that they didn't understand what it was being used for. They had no idea why that information was there. And then ultimately Facebook was, was using that to uh, sell that information to advertisers. And that worked really well for a long time. Um, and now it's different. And so, uh, yeah, just to, I think that kind of gives a little bit of context for the backstory of it. And then I guess from that point, um, it's been two and a half years. We we built to a point where we have sixteen hundred plus uh, e-commerce and D 2 C brands we're working with, scaling quickly. Uh, from there, um, we actually were acquired in twenty twenty two by WeCommerce, a, a e-commerce tech holding company out of Canada. And yeah, we deliver. I, I think Q four was over nine million questions answered on our platform. Um, so lots of data coming in. Um, and, and really kind of the big picture vision with what we're trying to do is, is deliver insight at scale for brands that are collecting data from their customers. Yeah. And so clearly, um, and you guys started in 2021, right? Uh, 2020, we launched like a pilot, uh, app and then 2021 was when we like actually launched our full platform. So that was September, 2021. Uh, we were in kind of in beta alpha phase for a while prior to that as well. Cool. Yeah. And I know like, um, so in, in the last two years, at least a, a lot of things have changed, especially like in yeah. our world is changing all, all the time. Yep. Um, I guess in those, since you founded no commerce, how have you seen the landscape and also like the demand for this first party, zero party, I'm going to keep switching those up, uh, the whole time. So <laughs> <laughs> zero party is uh, a version of first party kind of, or, or yeah. first party rather is a version of zero party. Anyway, it's, uh, it's yeah. all connected. <laughs> yeah. So I guess, how have you seen the, the landscape and the demand for that data shift over like just those two years? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, when we first set out to, to build this platform, the goal, so, so I actually like to kind of talk a, a bit about um, when I was growing up, my parents owned a small health food store in our hometown. And so you had customers that would walk through the door, your loyal customers, uh, you knew all about them. You knew about their family, you knew what kind of things they liked. You had an idea about their dietary preferences. Um, you had a lot of information about those people 
because you knew who they were. And we've lost that with, with digital commerce. It just doesn't exist in the same way, right? Um, we have audiences, <laughs> but that's not the same thing, right? And it's usually an audience around a specific activity or behavior. And so initially we set out to try to solve that problem. And that's still the, still the goal is to solve that problem. But then iOS 14.5 changes hit and basically I forget what the, I don't know what the latest numbers are, but the last number I saw was like almost 70% of people or maybe it was eight. It, most people are opting out of being tracked, right? It's a vast majority are opting out of being tracked. And so when that, we were already doing attribution surveys. So basically asking people, how did you hear about us? And, and we have a, a pretty sophisticated way of doing that. That's, that's unique and much more powerful than what people have done historically. Um, because we built a platform that was designed to be <laughs> more powerful, but basically like there's a few use cases like that, that have really kind of taken over our business. And that's a, a good thing. People want it and it's useful, but, um, I do think that's really caused a shift for us. Like we, we've really ended up going deeper into attribution than we intended, um, initially because that's such a massive need now for uh, for companies. And, and a lot of that just comes from that the shift in, in privacy and, and Apple specifically, like the changes that they made has had a massive impact on the industry. Yeah, it seems like, I don't know, there was sort of like a a mad dash when, when those updates were being announced to like figure out, okay, how are we gonna make our, you know, our post-purchase, pre-purchase surveys better? How are we gonna collect our own data? Uh, or who else are we going to buy our data from in mm -hmm. some cases, um, which is a lot of that going on. Um, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but, and, and you, you touched on attribution, I guess. Um, so like, why are so many brands seeing a, a challenge with that? And I guess what is like unique about no commerce or the way you see it as like an opportunity to, you know, more accurately report on that and understand it better. Yeah. So, I mean, in the past, like if you had a Facebook pixel on your website, if Facebook was tracking, they were tracking not only the activity on your website, but they were also tracking that person's activity across multiple websites, right? So they had a lot better context of a customer's journey than they do now. Um, and I think through a modeling, and, and I know what I'm hearing is Facebook's attribution is getting better, right? And so I think they've done a lot of modeling and, and things like that. But um, And so what happened was the industry, <laughs> everything changed. Basically, Facebook's reports didn't make sense at all. Uh, it, it just didn't work. And so that's where you've seen the rise of Triple Whale and North Beam and uh, Rockerbox has been here for a while. But like even Rockerbox has, I think, shifted their focus even more into attribution because there's such a massive need for these, these third-party tools. And I think what makes us really different, though, is that we're not reliant on a pixel. And the way that we... The way that we recommend running an, an attribution survey is actually multiple questions. So um, in the past, people would ask a single, how did you hear about us question? Uh, but it's actually a vague question. It doesn't give you enough context. And so uh, because most people have multiple touch points in a, a journey with a brand, right? So um, if I uh, learned about you initially through a friend, but then I saw an ad on Instagram today and I purchased, which one of those do I tell you about right and so what we actually do is we have brands ask how did you first hear about us then based on what they say we ask for a little bit more detail so if it was google we ask what they searched for um, if it was a social platform we asked who posted about us that's typically our recommendation from there and that helps you dive into the difference between organic and paid uh, a little bit better. It's not perfect, but uh, it's better than asking somebody if they saw an ad because people don't actually know the difference between an ad and an organic post most of the time. If you post organically or an influencer post, they'll call that an ad, but it may it's probably not actually a paid ad, right? Um, so asking who posted, where it, where it was placed, those kinds of questions can dive a little bit deeper into organic versus paid. Then we say ask uh, what brought you to our site today? And so there's typically a difference between discovery channels and purchase drivers. So what brought you to our site today should include email, text message, all of those kinds of things, right? Um, some follow-up questions around that with like, if, some, if it said ad, ask where they saw the ad. And then the last one that really helps uh, paint a, an amazing picture is actually the the question of how long did you know about us before placing your first purchase? And I think... To me, this indicates the biggest difference between what we see with pixel-based systems and I would argue even what what you would have seen through your Facebook ads manager a couple of years ago. 
um, when you're relying on a pixel, you're relying on uh, browsers, <laughs> like somebody using the same browser. I literally just switched browsers because I couldn't open uh, this this uh, window in my other browser, right? So I've, I've used two different browsers in the last 30 minutes. Um, so I could have been on a different browser, switch browsers, and you have no tracking of that. Um, different IP addresses, different uh, people, like maybe I found out about something, but my wife bought it. Um, and then there's just like a, a the cookies being cleared. Like there's a there's a time component where the longer somebody goes between discovering your brand and purchasing, the less likely they are to actually show up accurately through some sort of pixel tracking. And so what gets really cool is when we pull in that data to say, how long did you know about us? What we see is that a channel like Google, most people are purchasing, if they say they've discovered you through, through Google, they're typically purchasing in the first 24 hours to seven days. If they said they found you on TikTok, it's often a month, three months, 12 months before they purchase. And it makes sense when you think about who a customer is um, and their buying journeys. Because if I'm if I'm browsing TikTok and you're showing me a random ad for a product I've never seen before, I'm not in buying mode for that product. It may pique my interest. I might start thinking about that product and look to purchase it in the future but I'm not in buying mode. If I'm searching for something, I already know, I have some idea of the problem I'm trying to solve and the product type that I want. And so when I come to your website because I was searching for something specifically, I'm gonna buy a lot faster because I already have, like maybe I'm gonna go read some reviews and do some of that kind of stuff, but I'm in buying mode, I wanna buy. Um, and so I think that like there's, I don't think there's ever been a way of breaking that down in the past. And I, to me, that's really what makes what we do unique. Yeah, especially like for marketing teams that f sounds super valuable with like forecasting as well. It's like uh, I because the big the big thing right now is like coming from the top down, you know, uh, C suite all the way down to the the marketing team is like is like oh why aren't we on TikTok? Get on TikTok like and then it's like okay why aren't we why aren't we selling like hotcakes like right out of the gate? And it's like well, you need to like better understand the channel. You need to understand the journey that people are going through. And it's just, uh, oftentimes people just don't have the full picture. Um, and so clearly like these, the surveys and the data collection help with that. Yeah. So a, a good example of that. Um, I was talking to a brand recently, they were looking at TikTok specifically. And so because like in our platform, you can layer data essentially between different questions. So when somebody says they found you on TikTok, we can then layer that data onto how long they knew about you. And so uh, that first seven day window for TikTok, and this is not what I'm about to tell, you, to tell you is not universally true, but it's honestly fairly true for most brands. So in the first seven days, which is basically what their pixel tracking is picking up for them, they're seeing 15% of customers buy in that seven day window. 85% are buying beyond seven days. So to that brand, I said to them like, hey, look, your TikTok ads look like they're delivering a one row ads right now, right? Like if you're break even on ads in terms of dollars in, dollars out, you're probably going to earn $6 in the future on that. Like it might not be. So don't go spend <laughs> six to one. Like that doesn't make sense. But it, there is like, maybe it's okay to just break even because you know that this has a lot longer tail impact. Whereas on Google, you don't want to just break even because you're actually seeing most of the impact of that ad in that first seven day window. Um, so being able to have those kinds of conversations is really helpful for brands. Yeah, for sure. I want to double click into a little bit of that. Um, primarily, like I think one of the, the pitfalls when it comes to like any sort of data collection really or, or leveraging data is people collect, you know, tons of data, they collect it all day, but then they just like aren't using it effectively, yep. <laughs> uh, you know, or not even using it at all. It's like, great, we did it. Um, let's still just sit there now. I guess, how can like e-commerce brands, I guess, use this data like more effectively to drive ROI or, or you know, further than that, even just like measure it? Yeah, that is, uh, that's the big problem, right? Like we see that too. And, and we try to be pretty prescriptive with, with how we recommend collecting data, trying to structure it as much as possible. But even in that context, um, there's a lot of that. So, uh, and then, yeah, you get into like your order data, like there's a massive load of insight and data. So, um, 
without saying <laughs> a technology is the answer, I can tell you that like there's some really good benefits to using tools like Peel, Peel Insights is a partner of ours. Um, and in fact, I think they're they're based out of uh, New York uh, area as well. Oh, cool. Um, so awesome company. They do really good work, but like they have a way of they pull in your data, and they help you break down audiences, and then they give you like a daily report of that information. Um, help you understand like which audiences are are moving the needle, what's your revenue looking like, how is it compared to last month. So, um, and there's a, there's other tools out there that can do similar sorts of things for sure. Um, but like, that's a really good, powerful way of like, how do you go, like go to somebody that does this with a thousand merchants or 5,000 merchants, whatever they're working with, because they do have some insight into like what, like for your type of business, what's going to make sense. Um, there's obviously people you can hire for that, but I think that at the end of the day, like what you kind of need to do. And so to kind of back this up to the high level, you really need to find like a few specific things that actually are going to have some impact on your business measure those things there's nothing wrong with collecting other data uh, because that could be very useful in the future but i think the to, to kind of combat that data overload like try to identify what are those things that actually are going to have meaningful impact on your business double down on those um and and go from there so i I know that's not like, <laughs> it's not a perfect answer, but it, w the problem you're describing is a real problem. Like that, it's just, it's a reality of, of too much data. Yeah. I don't think there is a, a, you know, one answer to that question. I think it's like, it's, it's basically, I mean, you have to focus on the areas that you can actually like measure and compare against then just, you know, I, I think if you do too much, obviously all at once, it's like, you can't even understand what uh what what changes are happening or, or what trends um are, are coming up so i don't know it's different for for every organization too and you know sometimes it does take like a, a really solid tech partner to to help you you know parse through that information and, and actually make it actionable and you don't you don't have to pay them forever <laughs> <There's Right. that. laughs> it's true i i hate churn i hate when when people cancel but the reality is that sometimes you you need a different solution or a different way of thinking about that yeah um, so I'm curious, what is like the typical, cause I've never completed a post-purchase survey in my life. Um, I don't know if I plan to, uh, what, what it's like the typical like completion rate on those and like, are there ways to, uh, I, I don't know, improve that completion rate? Yeah. Um, I, I love that. I love how you framed that. <laughs> um, <laughs> cause it's true. Like different people, uh, honestly, like I don't really take surveys either um it depends on the context sometimes i will sometimes i won't right um but that that's true like some people will take these things and, and others won't um what i what's really fascinating is that two brands can run the same exact survey and have very different response rates um i've literally seen the same brand with a uk audience and a us audience have very different response rates um and I have no idea why, right? Like the, we're trying to figure out like, why is that? But the, the answer is, it just is what it is. So um, typically though, we see our, so our global average is about 45%. So about 45% of people who see a survey answer the first question. Um, we do some things that make that better. So like if you click, if you're using a radio question type, so a single multiple choice, single response, if you click an answer, we're going to actually move them to the next question. They can go back and edit if they want to. But what we do is we keep them moving through. We get that flow going. It feels really good. Um, it boosts response rates a little bit. Like there's some really good things with that that are uh, that are helpful. But in general, like just kind of like from, from a survey philosophy standpoint, start with questions that are non-invasive. So asking somebody, how did you first hear about us? not a personal question. Asking somebody for their age and gender is the first questions on a survey, you're gonna get a lower response rate. Um, so start with something that's that doesn't feel invasive um, and work into the more invasive personal questions. Uh, do multiple choice because that's gonna be the easiest to respond. Um, and then obviously like just anything that you can do to like placement, positioning of the survey, that kind of stuff has an impact too. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's 45% on average. We, I had one, I was just looking at the other day that was 9%. Um, that's because they've got a bunch of other things on their confirmation screen. And then, uh, another one I was looking at that was 89%. So it just really depends. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, the funniest thing to me though, is like the same brand, two different customer bases and on different continents have 
one of them has a, had a 21% response rate and the other one was like a 45 or something like that. So uh, just different. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's super interesting. It's also like I imagine it, a lot of it goes back into, I guess, the buying experience. Like if you had a positive buying experience, you're more likely to fill out the survey and, and provide some information to get like a more tailored ex experience next time, I think, as well. That would be interesting research, actually, to see, like, can we tie, like, when we do NPS, but yeah, look at, like, NPS versus response rate and see, like, does one do differently? Um, that'd be really interesting. Yeah. So in the way of, uh, I guess, like, more actionable insights, let's say, like, I'm a brand coming to work with no commerce for the first time, not really running surveys. Maybe I have a post-purchase survey, but it's not very good, I guess. What's, like, the order of operations you'd recommend for a brand like that? I, I imagine you'd start with a post-purchase survey and then would you like over time would you layer on more surveys like how do you look at it as far as like building that out from from the beginning yeah it's a good question a lot of it depends on your volume um so order volume um like when we have a gotcha. brand that's doing a hundred thousand plus orders a month we have different recommendations for them than a brand that's doing 500 so um and we literally do have that variance and more. We got some customers that are like two sir two responses a month. Um, but in that context, like typically, what we say is like if you're just getting going, start with just a generic survey um, for all all customers. So um, you know, do do your attribution survey, show it to everybody. We've got some cool modeling tools that like the more the more people you get data on, the better that modeling is going to be. That kind of stuff. Um, and then let's say you you got good, decent volume, you're over a thousand orders a month, then you might want to drop in a returning customer survey, um, ask some different cost questions of your returning customers. Um, then let's say you've got, you know, like 10,000 plus orders a month. That's where you might start looking at things like surveying based off of a specific uh, product purchased. So like if you bought X product, ask Y questions. Um, survey based off of a location like that's another interesting one let's say you're trying to get into retail stores in california ask your california customers which stores they shop on right so there's a there's a lot of things that you can do where like basically the the larger you are the and also like are you just selling online or are you selling in retail because if you're in retail there's a kind of a whole nother layer of insight that you can unlock um that really justifies going deeper and then the last thing that we really try to get brands doing is is what we call actions so it's basically leveraging surveys to push somebody to do something so let's say in the context of a survey i ask you are you interested in referring a friend to to x brand um like carnivore snacks is one we work with and they're they're doing this so they have they have a returning customer survey literally the survey is just and it's for people that already answered their other survey they say are you interested in referring a friend if they say yes they literally pop like a refer a friend widget right in front of them um so you're getting opt-in consent from the customer and that's a whole lot more powerful in terms of driving uh action as well yeah definitely it seems like you know, you need to at least be able to get the level of data to, to do something with it. Like two surveys yep. a month is a little tough to yeah. do anything with that. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's 50, 50 shot, who knows what they're going to say. Um, yep. And then, yeah, I guess like somehow and like enticing or encouraging someone to fill out a survey to then like do something more specific um, seems like a good strategy as well. Yeah, for sure. And we don't typically recommend just like incentives so yeah. um it depends on the brand again like everything as it depends right. <laughs> uh the the cliche response but it's true um but yeah anyway it's uh that that's kind of the, the approach we take yeah cool so uh like one final question i like to end every single one on this um in five years from now when we're looking at i guess the the winners and the losers or the not so much winners uh comparing them how are the winners using zero party data and and uh or you know uh surveys to you know set themselves apart from the competition and you can take yeah. that in any direction you want that's a great question um uh, one thing that's that i will say that's really interesting from from what i see from my side as as a technology provider is that there definitely seems to be a growing gap between like I mean, just like everything, there's like the haves and the have-nots, right? And I feel like there's a set of brands that have really identified what their success metrics look like, and they've really figured out how to lean into those, and they are scaling fast, and they are growing very quickly. 
and everybody else is kind of stagnant right now. Um, and so I think there's, that's really what we're looking at in the future. Um, I think those brands that are able to scale quickly and get to a certain size are going to be able to leverage zero party data for more of like the personalization and kind of diving deeper into, and I think AI is going to help with that as well. Um, but there's a volume of data that you have to have in order to get to that point. Um, and my concern then is that the smaller brands aren't going to be able to do that. And so I think like when we look at our future as a company and how we play into this, it's really trying to support like those bigger companies, obviously, and, and the personalization and some of those things that they'll be able to do. Um, but then also s leveraging scale of data to still give really great insight to the companies that don't have the scale on their own. Um, and I, I think that's just the reality is that that's what we're going to see is, is kind of a, a couple of different cohorts. And that doesn't mean you have a bad business if you're doing a thousand orders a month. That's still a great business, um, but you're not doing a million orders a month, right? And, and there's going to be a difference in the way that those kinds of companies use data. Yeah, I definitely think we'll see that gap like continue to increase. I mean, you think about these... The, the, the huge brands that have, you know, full buildings, full, full hundred person teams dedicated to, to just this, like it's, uh, it, it's pretty easy for them to, you know, run away with it, um, given the resources that they have. But, you know, I think, uh, like, as you said, there's so many tools nowadays, like, like no commerce and, and others in, in different areas that can help like these smaller brands, um, do a lot of that work without, um, as much of an investment in, in all those resources. Yep. For sure. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we will uh, add your, your website and your Twitter into our, into our show notes below. But I don't know. Is there anything exciting coming down the pike we should know about personally, professionally, no commerce related? Yeah, man. Um, we've got some, yeah, we, we got ad platforms taking a notice of what we're doing and wanting more people to, do, to use our technology. So that's kind of cool. Um, you'll see some of that stuff coming out. Um, so yeah, I <laughs> tell about all the information I can share right now, but yeah, there's, there's some cool stuff there. Um, and that's, that's kind of, I, I mean, yeah, just building, building surveys, uh, kind of in the daily grind. Um, but yeah, man, it's really, really great to chat with you. Thanks for having me on. We'll have to chat some more at some point too. Of course. Yeah. Thanks so much again for joining us. We'll be on the lookout for all those exciting new updates and we'll catch you all next time on Reel It In.